When you hear people throwing around the terminology big pharma, it, mm-hmm. you know, I, I feel like when I hear that, it comes off derogatory now. What, what, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it has like a negative connotation for sure. And, and rightly so. I mean, there's a lot of things that uh, these major pharmaceutical companies, in my opinion, do that definitely seems like they're just chasing money. I mean, there, there are certain drugs that are developed that are maybe like combinations of two drugs that have been out for a while that are available generically. They'll combine those two drugs and then mark it up literally like a hundredfold. Um, there's a couple of ones out there I won't mention, but uh, you know, they're three, $400 when in reality, it's a combination of two generic drugs that have been out for 20, 30 years that if you bought them separately and on your own and knew what you were doing, you're talking about like dollars a month instead of $400 a month. So they, they do some of, they do some of that, but um, on like a global scale, as far as like, I don't want to talk out of pocket, but as far as like capitalism goes with the United States, without these major drug companies turning major profits, you just don't get like the research and the push for innovation and like, uh, you know, new medications to come out to treat, to treat disease states, uh, you know, um, countries that have socialized, socialized healthcare, socialized medicine typically don't have a lot of research money spent towards development of new drugs. So it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword, you know, it's, it's, um, capitalism at its finest, but it's also, um, the way that we're improving outcomes for patients all over the world. Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to Josh Has Issues. I'm your host, Josh Murphy, the man with all the issues. Today on the show, my oldest friend, pharmacist Dr. Adam Fuline, pulls back the curtain on retail pharmacy. If you're a human being and you've lived on planet Earth the last few years, you've likely been unable to escape conversations about pharmaceutical issues. Big Pharma, COVID vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, J&J, Ivermectin, SSRIs. Not unlike the conditions they treat, these topics jumped from the privacy of the doctor's offices and labs where they originated and into the public discourse. And because most people have twisted their fair share of child-safe bottle tops, been vaccinated once, twice, a thousand times, and watched countless hours of interviews with Dr. Fauci, we all feel somewhat qualified to weigh in on this worldwide multi-billion dollar industry. But the truth is, the closest most of us have gotten to this topic, the topic of big pharma, is walking through the automatic sliding glass doors of our friendly local retail pharmacy. And we don't even know that much about that. We're going to try to change that today. Across my conversation with Dr. Fuline, we touch on a variety of topics, including the circle of life of the pharmaceutical ecosystem, the pharmacist's responsibilities and ethics, what's inside America's medicine cabinets, and so, so much more. Adam's a great dude. I'm so grateful to him for agreeing to be my very first interview. And I think our conversation went great. Without further ado, my conversation with pharmacist Dr. Adam Fuline. Thanks for doing this, buddy. You're very welcome. My pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> you mind starting us out by doing a, a little thumbnail sketch of your career? Give me plus or minus 30 seconds. All right. So I graduated from a uh, pharmacy school in Philadelphia in 2009. Uh, who, uh, during which I interned at a major retail pharmacy throughout my uh, six years through my doctoral program. Uh, I graduated, moved back to Ohio, uh, was a staff pharmacist for a few years, and then I've been a pharmacy manager for, well, it's about nine years now. I don't actually feel like I understand the full ecosystem of uh, big pharma or the pharmaceutical system that we live in. Would you mind taking a minute and explaining that circle of life? Yeah. So as a, uh, as a pharmacist in a retail pharmacy, you know, a community pharmacy, uh, we are kind of precariously in the middle of like four major, major key players. Um, we're at first and foremost, we're, we're um, talking and communicating and helping and servicing uh, the public. So our patients, um, then of course we are dealing with uh, major drug pharma, you know, drug companies, uh, in order to procure our medications. Uh, we deal with, um, you know, insurance companies, uh, hundreds of times a day, uh, in order to get people's prescriptions covered and, and, um, you know, get them on their way, uh, getting better. 
Um, and then we're, you know, we're like also in like the public eye uh, of healthcare and delivering like just really good health services and free, uh, you know, free advice and free uh, healthcare screening that people call all the time and ask us any off the wall question that they, they want to come up with. You work for one of the major pharmacy retail chains in the United States. You, you manage a location. You've done that for a long time. When you hear the term big pharma in the news, what does that make you think of? And do you feel like you're a part of that? Or do you feel like you're part of the, the chain someplace else related to it, but not part of that mechanism? I, I feel like, um, you know, I'm involved with those folks, you know, those, those major companies that are um, billions and billions of dollars of, of making money and turning profit and, and doing, you know, a lot of research uh, and making a lot of money off that research. Um, but we don't feel like most retail pharmacists, I would think, would agree that we don't feel uh, like we're a part of that um, because ultimately it's your doctor's decision as to like, you know, what medications people are placed on. They've actually tried to like eliminate bias in pharmacies. It's um, I'm pretty sure it's illegal or at least it's unethical for like a drug rep to come into our pharmacies and distribute drug rep type things to try to like influence us. So. They've made steps, the pharmacy boards of various states. Um, well, I want to interrupt made, you there. What, what do you mean by that? And has, did that happen during the course of your career over the past like 15 years? Or was that something that predated your time in the industry? When no, was, that, yeah, that happened while I was in school. I remember drug reps being able to come into the pharmacies or come you know, to the pharmacy counter and talk to the pharmacist or the pharmacy manager uh, that was there at the time. And they could, they could give you some information and a pamphlet and then, then they would pass out, you know, and they give you like free swag, you get like pens and notepads and, you know, things like that. And, uh, either while I was in school or maybe right after I, uh, graduated, it then became company policy to not allow those folks in. And I'm pretty sure it became more of a law that they're not able to come in and, uh, you know, press you in any kind of way. Uh, we're supposed to, uh, basically get them out if they have any kind of solic solicitation in the store. When you hear people throwing around the terminology, big pharma, it, mm -hmm. you know, I, I feel like when I hear that it comes off derogatory now. What, what, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it has like a negative connotation for sure. And, and rightly so. I mean, there's a lot of things that uh, these major pharmaceutical companies, in my opinion, do that definitely seems like they're just chasing money. I mean, there, there are certain drugs that are developed that are maybe like combinations of two drugs that have been out for a while that are available generically. They'll combine those two drugs and then mark it up literally like a hundredfold. Um, there's a couple of ones out there I won't mention, but uh, you know, they're three, $400 when in reality, it's a combination of two generic drugs that have been out for 20, 30 years that if you bought them separately and on your own and knew what you were doing, you're talking about like dollars a month instead of four hundred dollars a month. So they they do some of they do some of that, but um, on like a global scale, as far as like I don't want to talk out of pocket, but as far as like capitalism goes with the United States, without these major drug companies turning major profits, you just don't get like the research and the push for innovation and like uh, you know new medications to come out to treat to treat disease states. Uh, you know um, countries that have socialized socialized healthcare socialized medicine typically don't have a lot of research money spent towards development of new drugs so it's it's kind of a double edged sword you know it's it's um, capitalism at its finest but it's also um, the way that we're improving outcomes for patients all over the world yeah it, it does seem like at every side of your business i think probably as in most businesses there are um there are ethical questions to be wrestled with every day. And sure. when, when we were talking uh, on a phone call before this actual recording, you were talking to me about the, the main directives, the two main directives that you had in your role. Can you talk about those and explain where the ethical concerns come in for you um, and if it's challenging or if you feel like you got it handled? Uh, remind me of those two. <laughs> the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those two no. things. You you had said you had said two of them were managing data and driving profitability. Is it, did I get that right or not? Yeah. Oh, so as far you as just, you just you just make that shit up. You just make that shit up in our previous conversation or what? 
yeah, I can't remember which pile of bullshit I was uh, shoveling. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so yeah, you could definitely summarize like my job um, as, as a pharmacy manager um, is is kind of it's the go between between a com- you know a company's uh, corporate structure and like the profitability of like a retail pharmacy. I'm like the go between between them and their company initiatives and uh, just a pharmacist in the field dispensing medications, checking for med errors. So what that means to me. Wait, wait, say that again. You're you know, checking in the field, I, checking for, for, what did you say? Checking for what? Yeah, one of the many things a pharmacist does is check for medication errors or, or, or reduce medication errors. So, Got you know, we're, we're, looking at a, we're looking at a prescription from the doctor. We're making sure that it's, it was written for the right patient and it's, it's for the um, appropriate dose of a certain medication. It doesn't interact with, you know, half a dozen or a dozen other meds that they're taking. Uh, if it's a child, it's got to be dosed appropriately. You know, if it's like weight-based dosing, we do all of that. So a lot of times we're there um, helping doctors out, and, uh, reducing reducing errors. And for the most part, they like pharmacists or they, they know that we have their back and we and we help them in, in that in that degree. But um, yeah, so like uh, we're we're doing that. So that's uh, that's patient safety it results in patient safety and, and improved uh, health measures for them. Uh, but then also as a pharmacy manager, I see you know, more of a spreadsheet as to how profitable we are, what kind of numbers we track. Uh, we track all kinds of different numbers. It's kind of like baseball. We keep kind of track of everything. So uh, we look at, um, you know, uh, issues with profitability. We look at um, how quickly we're checking scripts, how happy we're making our patients. We look at the percentage of prescriptions that are filled for 90 days versus 30 days, all these different kinds of measures that as a pharmacy manager, I'm accountable for for my pharmacy and i'm accountable for driving it and improving it i assume that probably a lot of that information either comes through with the scripts or is self-volunteered kind of survey kind of stuff how much of that is observational stuff on your end yeah so it's things that like a, a company will track you know if you go to like an independent on the corner that's owned by you know a, a guy who has owned it for 30 40 years he probably doesn't really have any data like that at all but when you work for a major retail pharmacy it's going to be ramped up they're going to monitor pretty much you know everything and they do it uh for a lot of different reasons uh you know probably maybe maybe most of which is uh profitability and driving profitability so that we can all have jobs and you know the lights stay on but uh a lot of it is patient safety um a lot of it's like retaining uh, patients and, and keeping, you know, your script volume high and high enough to, you know, afford to pay the bills and everything. Um, but yeah, in, independents certainly probably don't, don't do that nearly as much. Um, some maybe not even at all. I, I did a rotation in Philadelphia for like eight weeks where the independent certainly didn't have that technology that monitored things like that. I mean, he was, he was on a very primitive type system. Um, so that's just the difference between maybe between a large retail pharmacy and a smaller one. What, what, how do you use the data to drive profitability? Are you just talking about like offers or are you talking about automated reminders that pop up in pe- people's email or, or, you yeah, know, no, that's a good, uh, good point. So yeah, there's, um, you know, the going trend now is to get everybody digital. So to, uh, give people uh, refill reminders and, uh, automatic refills. And, and we have, uh, you know, all these different retailers have apps that you can use where you can see your medications. You can see when you received them last, you can click a button and, you know, you just placed an order for a refill and you can choose when you want to pick it up. So, you know, those types of things drive convenience. Um, but they also drive, um, you know, the patients from getting and compl- we call it compliance, which is patients taking their uh, a maintenance medication regularly. Um, the proportion of days covered is a term that you'll hear with, uh, with, you know, insurance companies, certainly Medicare Part D companies, they look at what percentage of the patient's meds are picked up and on hand uh, throughout the year. And, you know, they have, there's a certain goal that all these different Medicare D plans have for us to keep that number high. And ultimately, that, that, that does one of two things. A, it keeps the patient coming back to your pharmacy and making, you know, the company money. Uh, but B, it keeps the patient on their chronic important maintenance med, which they've studies have shown that non-compliance patients who don't take their meds have way worse outcomes and they cost their insurance way more money, much more money uh, because not taking their meds, uh, you know, results in detrimental effects on their health. So that's where the profitability and then the, you know, ethical issue of uh, making people safe and healthy and improving their health 
those two things kind of agree there. It, it, you know, the one, one increases the other. They're, they're kind of directly proportional to one another. When you say maintenance medication, I'm imagining like cholesterol medication or something like that. Sure. What, 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 sure. what are, what classifies? Diabetes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Go yeah, ahead. The no. Hypertension, uh, you know, um, COPD, asthma, th- things that don't go away. Um, you know, people, the things that people are going to be on for months, years, you know, the rest of their life, we call those maintenance meds. You must have a pretty good idea of what Americans have in their medicine cabinets. What are the most common drugs in your experience? And I, and I assume that probably there are geographic regions across the country that have different data and different medications. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, it very well could be um, that depending on where you're at, uh, you're going to have a different, uh, you know, top moving uh, class of medication. Um, in certain areas, it's pain medications. Um, and even, even that comes with like a negative connotation, but pain affects us all in many different ways. There's a lot of different reasons for pain. Um, so pain medications from anywhere from like naproxen and ibuprofen all the way up to, you know, your, your really strong opioids, that's going to be some of your highest movers, but, uh, diabetes, uh, hypertension, which is high blood pressure, um, hypercholesterolemia, which is high cholesterol. Um, you know, those, those types of things, big movers, you have a lot of patients with those, those, um, you know, heart meds, uh, I think heart disease is still one of the leading causes of death in the country. So a lot of meds to treat that. Um, but yeah, just, just your common disease states. If you talk to a handful of your relatives that are, you know, any age group, but certainly 50 and up, um, you can ask them what they're on and, and that tends to be a kind of a snapshot on what people take uh, on a regular basis. And you had mentioned something to me before about um, there being big time issues with a lawsuit uh, out of uh, Northeast Ohio, specifically about opiates. Um, yeah. did, did you yeah. feel what could you talk about what happened there? And, and did you feel like it was warranted? How, how did you feel about that? Um, yeah, so there was like a lawsuit and I, I can't go into too much detail about the parties involved because I don't want to give uh, incorrect information, but there was a lawsuit between uh, the state and um, three or four major retail pharmacies in the northeast corner of Ohio, uh, basically finding them or attempting to find them responsible for the opioid crisis that has affected northeast Ohio which I don't dispute. There certainly is an opioid crisis probably all over the country, but certainly uh, in the neck of the woods that I work in. And um, so ultimately, you know, they found uh, that the the pharmacies are liable and the lawsuit was for tens of millions, if not maybe hundreds of millions that these major chain pharmacies had to pay. Um, But the interesting caveat for for that and for pharmacists uh, such as myself and my peers is that we don't feel like we are the culprits really at all um, because we have a certain set of guidelines that we follow. Um, I can't tell you what it is because it would kind of give away what retail pharmacy I work for, but we have an ethical set of guidelines that we follow that basically ensures that every prescription that is dispensed from the pharmacy is a legitimate prescription for a legitimate patient, for a legitimate disease state. And what we find ourselves is in between two different parties that push us to do uh, the dispensing of pain meds. You've got your doctors who are the ones ultimately prescribing these meds um, in high numbers in this part of the country and in many other parts of the country. Um, then you have the patients who are coming in, bringing you this prescription, demanding that they, you know, they have it filled. Um, so you, we run down all these guidelines and make sure that it's not dosed too high and this patient doesn't also fill at any other pharmacy or other pharmacies. And if so, what are they receiving? And is it on time? And we have diagnosis codes that these prescriptions are required to have. And, you know, we do everything we can to reduce the idea or the concept or the threat of there being uh, a pill mill type situation um, in this in this part of the country, particularly for my retail pharmacy. So we do all these different steps to make sure that we're not over dispensing opioids. And then ultimately, this court, you know, hearing this this trial found that it's the pharmacies and um, we'll take our money now. So I think if you were to poll or if you were to ask pharmacists in, in my field, if they love and if, and if there's any kickback for them to dispense opioids, there's really not. There's, uh, it, it doesn't go into my numbers, doesn't go into my bottom line. I don't get bonused on it. So they've removed all those incentives for you know, a chain pharmacy, certainly, to, to pump them out, be a pill mill. And uh, even so, the, the, the court still found that retail pharmacies were 
um, somehow the culprits. I think it had to do with the fact that it would be more difficult to prosecute hundreds, if not thousands of prescribers. It's easier just to, you know, have a lawsuit with three or four parties than a couple thousand. But it was pretty frustrating, to say the least. I feel like the pharmaceutical industry is under the gun lately post COVID. You know, I feel like there's there was a lot of skepticism about the vaccine rollout. Um, you know, you guys were right at the center of administering the vaccines. And, you know, I think you were involved in a significant way with a, with a lot of that. That was a huge part of your business and probably still is, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's something that we, we definitely are highly involved with. We, uh, we were there with COVID when it wasn't even available for, um, you know, walk-in patients. It was only available for nursing home and long-term care facility type patients. And we were uh, having clinics where we would go, uh, myself, several other pharmacists, and this is all over the, all over the country for my, for my pharmacy um, company. Uh, but yeah, we were going right into the, the lines then, essentially these places that um, you had a 20, 30% infection rate uh, in these wings that it was just loaded with COVID. And we were there vaccinating the patients who didn't have COVID um, before really we even understood the long lasting effects or the real risk of, of getting the vaccine. So it kind of felt pioneering in a way, um, you know, kind of leading the charge to get people on their way to being immune to COVID. And then eventually as time went by, they released it to the individual pharmacies and we were able to give it to patients who could just walk in. But we were kind of geared for that. We've been vaccinating since, uh, since I graduated, I think 2009 was the year that Ohio passed the, um, the legality for, for us to pharmacists to be able to administer vaccination. So it was kind of a coincidence that I graduated the first year where they did that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, uh, it's a lot, it's a high volume of vaccines that we do. We do a lot of non COVID vaccines. Of course we do, you know, flu and, but we do hepatitis and tetanus, diphtheria. You know, we, we do basically any vaccine that is administered. We do that as well. So that's, that's all a part of our, our daily routine. Over the past couple of weeks, multiple stories have broken about things like uh, a realization that antidepressants um, aren't necessarily treating depression in the way that they were initially represented by uh, pharmaceutical companies. There was another study that essentially um, was saying that Alzheimer's research as we know it and our understanding of the plaque in the brain that causes Alzheimer's was misrepresented was misrepresented by someone who was preparing the studies were realizations like this happening over the course of the last two decades across your career that you can remember but the public just didn't really care about them or does this feel like a new trend now that the public has new interest in medications and science that's that's part one and um part two you know, before there is some earth shattering announcement in the news that, you know, uh, uh, essentially like a takedown piece on SSRIs is about to hit. Do you guys get any kind of heads up about that? Or are you just completely sandbagged at work with people coming in and asking you crazy questions? Um, I'll, I'll say this. We don't really get any inside information on any new studies that have come out. Um, that's kind of on our, our, that's put into our own laps as to, um, you know, doing your own due diligence and, and reading studies and reading review articles. So that's kind of on, on ourselves in order to maintain, uh, you know, enough continued education to uh, still be on track with uh, what's going on in healthcare. Um I think it's interesting and I like it. What I like about science and what I like about, um, you know, medicine and healthcare is that we are always kind of rechallenging um, old truths, you know, things that we thought, well, that's definitely how that works, you know, and, and that's how we're going to treat it till the end of time. Every now and then you'll have someone that wants to invest time and money and, and resources into investigating why, you know, why, why are we doing it that way? Can we, can we still, base the effectiveness and safety of this medication on a study that was done 20 or 30 years ago, or should we revisit that and, and pick that apart and try to figure out what's going on there? So I like it. I like hearing studies like that. Um, you know, uh, that study you're talking about, I read briefly was, was talking about, and, uh, there may not be a correlation between serotonin levels and uh, depression, yeah. but in the article, it still says, but don't, don't stop taking your antidepressants just yet. You know, we still need to figure out what this really means 
because in other clinical trials, there, there is effectiveness uh, compared to like placebo of an antidepressant for depression versus just placebo. So we know that, or we think we know that, uh, you know, they, they still work and, and they're still helping folks, but maybe the reason of why, wh why they, they work at, um, may need to have more studies, you know, conducted. And maybe, maybe there's another pathway we don't know about and we can, we can explore that pathway and find an antidepressant that works in a different way and helps people more and has better outcomes, higher, higher amounts of effectiveness with lower amounts of side effects. I mean, it's pretty exciting. I, I, I do like hearing review articles and, and trials that kind of challenge uh, the old train of thought. And I think a lot of the coverage, uh, you know, of this recent realization saying that SSRIs may not work the way we thought they did. Um, you know, really pushed forward the idea that a massive percentage of the American population and, and the population across Western Europe also are on antidepressants. You know, I think the numbers that, that I heard thrown around were something like um, one in eight Americans, you know, or uh, one in eight Americans or one in 29 teens age 12 to 19. Do, do you find in your capacity that you see a ton of antidepressants going out your doors. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of our, um, I'm surprised I didn't mention earlier, but it's one of our, you know, big movers uh, when you were asking what kind of meds are the most commonly prescribed and, and dispensed, um, antidepressants and antipsychotics, uh, they're right up there. Um, yeah, it, what's, what may be alarming on a, on a national or global scale is the, uh, proportion of those that are being prescribed to like teenagers. Um, I can tell you that since I was in pharmacy school and since I graduated that the percent of people that are on neurostimulants like, um, Adderall, Concerta, Ritalin, um, Vyvanse, all of those, that number of dispensing has gone up rather dramatically, uh, particularly in the last, I'd say three to five years, um, enough so that it's raised, you know, eyebrows and pharmacy managers and even pharmacists, uh, you know, we, we talk about it and, and, you know, we're, we're at, we're talking to the sky and we do, but you know, where the, where's this coming from? Why, why is this being, why is this increasing? Is the disease state increasing or is the dispensing or the, the prescribing, you know, increasing? And it, you don't know always how far it'll go or what direction you're going, but it, it's certainly, it, it's a little alarming in that, in that respect of how many neurostimulants are being prescribed, not just the kids that are in school, but middle-aged adults, older adults. And um, yeah, I, I'd be interested to see where that goes. I, I hope, I really hope that we're not heading towards, you know, the next crisis, you know, we might be done with opioids and now we're going towards neurostimulant crisis. That could be just as bad, if not worse. So something you, that um, we're mindful of. Do you have an opinion? You said you guys talk about it. You know, why are these kind of mood modifying, um, you know, uh, drugs being prescribed more. Why has there been such an uptick? Do you, do you think it's cultural? Do you think there are real despair issues that are happening that you're watching be exacerbated in that part of the country? What, what's your thought? Yeah, I, it, I mean, it's probably wow. We could probably pick at that for a while. I mean, there, there's there's probably many reasons why um, it's happening. Uh, culturally, we're like shifting towards, and you know, we're we're shooting a podcast right now, but you know, social media and all that, it wasn't around 20 years ago and things are certainly changing. People are ex exposed and being exposed to things that they never would have seen. And may maybe that's detrimental to people's mental health. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's like a grass is greener type situation where if you see a lot of people happy online, you may not feel as happy as you used to. I think my own personal opinion is that medication, adding a medication to someone's therapy is just a, a piece of treating someone um, for whatever dis disease state it may be. I think it's important to always consider lifestyle modifications, um, counseling in, in the event of it's a, a psychi psychiatric type thing. And I feel like so often Americans want a pill. They just want a pill. They want to go to the doctor, be told what's wrong with them. They want a pill. They want to go home, take it, and they want it to all go away. But there are just so many things that would be treated so much more effectively if done in a combination with non-medication type treatments. Do you feel like your business is politicized? And if, if so, does that affect you? What way would you mean that? Well, I, I mean, let's, let's take COVID, for example, because it's low-hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
there was instantly a massive controversy about you know whether the vaccine had been tested enough, whether it was dangerous, whether it was fascist to require a population to get you know one dose or two or three or four. You know, and I, I don't know what percentage ended up at the end of the day being vaccine, you know, averse or deniers or refusers or whatever you want to talk about it. But, you know, I do think there is probably a big percentage of the population um, uh, that, that declined, um, you know, and I certainly know that it can be a hot button topic when you talk to friends and family and co coworkers and stuff about it. So, I, you know, I feel like personally that was very politicized. Um, did you feel the effects of that? Uh, yeah, yeah, like on a personal level and on like a professional level, um, you know, you had uh, the government and, and, you know, my company saying vaccinate as many people as you can, um, you know, get them out, get them in. Uh, we have a lot of different marketing for, for, you know, patients to let them know that we have it available and, and we make it um, as convenient as possible for them to get it. So you've got a lot of push from the government, a lot of push from, um, you know, the company you work for. Um, and then you have, you know, you have the concern that, well, I want to see some data. I, I want to know that what I'm doing in the public is beneficial for the public. They were very good. I'm surprised that my company was as good as they were. They gave us a lot of literature before we started um, going into these clinics, which was the first step of delivering COVID vaccinations. They gave us a lot of clinical data to say, Here's what we have. Here's what we're looking at. Here's how effective it is and how safe it is from what we know so far, of course, uh, because that whole approval um, process was extremely fast, uh, but thorough. So once I saw the data and I knew that um, I felt comfortable getting it myself, which I did uh, the, the day before I went to the clinic that I went to, um, which I think was one of the first clinics in this part of the state. Um, once I felt comfortable to get it, I felt comfortable enough to give it to others. Um, so yeah, there's definitely two different directions of pull there where you've got it being really heavily pushed from the government and the, the pharmacy you work for, and then maybe push back from patients who they don't trust the data and they don't trust science. And that's, you know, that's a major thing too. You with social media and, and Wikipedia and, you know, all, all the information you get on the internet, there's a lot of Google doctors or whatever they might call themselves or, or people, you know, that whatever that term may be, but, um, most people put, or a lot of people put their faith in the folks that have devoted their lives to doing this. And those are ultimately like most of the people that I'm vaccinating are folks that are saying, you know, I, I don't understand some of the clinical evidence, but, um, you seem to know a lot about it. My doctor highly recommends it, you know, surgeon general recommends it. I'm going to get it. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of different directions on that. That's a whole topic in itself, really. What are the next trends in, uh, medication that are going to be widely prescribed? What are the new miracle drugs? Do you have any perspective on that? Um, there's some really cool stuff coming that are uh, some, some cool things that are coming that are injectable that use like monoclonal antibody type uh, technology. Um, they, they prescribe that stuff for COVID, right? That's the first time I heard that. Uh, well, so I'm more referring to things that we use for um, chronic uh, conditions that are more like autoimmune diseases, but, but that's how they were kind of developed, uh, things that fight down certain cells in your body that host immune response. So they were developed for, um, COPD or ulcerative colitis, um, Crohn's, things like that. But, but, but now they're finding COPD? some injection. What's that? COPD, chronic obstructive, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, you know, a lung disease where you're your cells and your um, alveoli are, uh, are damaged and will always be damaged and they produce mucus. And it's basically like chronic, severe asthma. Interesting. Um, but the, there's some stool there's some cool stuff coming out for um, other disease states uh, like cholesterol. Um, there's some things that are injectable that aren't insulin, but they're similar to and enhance your body's own ability to produce insulin. Um, those are coming along. There used to be only I think when I was in pharmacy school, there was only really two injections that were non-insulin uh, for diabetes. And now there's, God, there's got to be close to 10. Um, they're expensive. They cost these companies a lot of money to make. Uh, it's a huge cost to the um, healthcare industry as far as like insurance goes. Um, so that's certainly a negative, but um, they're really neat with how well and how effective they are at treating diabetes or cholesterol. Um, 
And I, I think that's kind of the forefront. I remember reading an article maybe a few years back that monoclonal antibodies was the next, the next big, big thing. So it's pretty neat. It's, it's it, uh, really dumbed down. It's, it's technology that uses synthesized antibodies that then work on receptors that are specific for that antibody. So instead of taking a medication orally that's distributed all throughout your body and hitting all kinds of different things, these things are going directly where they need to go. Uh, and work on receptors that they need to work on. So it's kind of like a smart drug. It, it, it's pretty cool. The other drug that's getting a lot of press right now, especially in right-wing media, are puberty blockers. Is this something that you're even tracking or you've seen happen at all? Uh, are, are you aware of this and have you detected an uptick? Uh, so yeah, this that's basically something that I know nothing about. I'm, I'm in Ohio. Um, I don't know if it's a regional thing. But uh, kind of a conservative state. Um, we, the, the, as far as puberty blocking goes, I know basically next to nothing. We can even call it nothing about that. Um, but we do a lot of hormone therapy for patients who are like transgender. Um, I've noticed that's certainly an uptick, um, which is pretty neat. Um, you know, we can we can supplement them with their testosterone or their estrogen and, and guide them through that. So that 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 has certainly increased. I think when I uh, took over at the location I'm at now, I maybe only had one person making that change. And now I've got, I've got at least a dozen. So that's increased. Um, I don't have much of an opinion about that. I feel, I feel like it's, uh, not to get too taboo, but I I feel like it's their bodies and that's that's what they want to do. That's what they want to do. So I'm there to support that and make sure it's dosed properly and, and they're taking it right. So yeah, we're here for that. I actually generally agree with the notion that, you know, it's your body and the way you want to treat it and what you want to put into it is your business. Um, Mm -hmm. At what point do you feel like it becomes an ethical concern when you're dealing with the power of influence of companies with billions of dollars? You know, I'm not just talking about pharmaceutical companies. I, I think I'm talking about pharmaceutical companies in conjunction with media companies, in conjunction with news. You know, I, I feel like they can be incredibly influential. Um, what should the limits be? Do you, do you think there bound, should be boundaries beyond which you should not prescribe medicine to people? Yeah, there are certain system situations that we've seen and we learn about before we even graduate. Like at one part of um, anybody graduating from a pharmacy school is that they're going to take um, a law and ethics course which is a combination of pharmacy law, which is a board we have to pass. Each state has their own law board. So any pharmacy graduate is going to be taking like a law class. Um, but it, they also tie in ethics, um, which is a, now that I look back at it now as a full grown adult and not when I was, you know, a young 23 year old punk. But um, it's really interesting because there is a role for ethics in medicine. Um, and we learn how to, try to objectively look at something and maintain, you know, uh, a level of, uh, of ethic throughout the entire process of filling someone's prescription. Uh, but we are entitled to a little bit of our own opinion, um, and our own, you know, our own standards, there are situations, um, well, I'll give an example. So when I graduated pharmacy school, um, plan B, you know, the emergency contraceptive sure. was, at that time only available by prescription. And they had a, I remember writing a paper in my sixth year that discussed the ethical, uh, uh, you know, uh, battle as to whether or not it should be available over the counter. Um, I think in that paper, I wrote that I supported its use in being sold over the counter to adults, um, 18, you know, 18 and over. Um, ultimately that's what they ended up doing. Uh, they made it, uh, available over the counter, um, it's 18 and only, so you had to ID, uh, young men and women, uh, for the, for the medication. And now it's available to anybody, um, you know, 13 year old can walk in and, and buy plan B. There is, there is no minimum age requirement. I think, um, I think it's a struggle. And I think there are as many opinions on something like that, uh, as there are people on, on, on the planet. Um, I'm normally pretty moderate, uh, so long as it's not, uh, super extreme. If it's your body and you choose to do it, I, I tend to, you know, allow it. Um, I, I know some pharmacists who don't feel comfortable dispensing birth control. I know some pharmacists who don't feel responsible, uh, dispensing Suboxone, which is, you know, uh, a medication used for 
patients trying to detox and stay off of opioids. So I'm, I'm not that extreme. I'm, I'm much more in the middle uh, in that respect. Where do you fall on the new trend that I feel like I've tracked over the past few years, which is a rise in doctors utilizing psychedelics in medical treatments? Is that something that you feel like will ever become mainstream enough that it will be part of your purview as a, a retail pharmacist? Well, I think they certainly could if, if there's enough evidence to support its use. Um, you know, uh, we, we can look at the way that cannabis uh, has been treated in the last 10 years. Um, that really wasn't, to my knowledge, even on the horizon when I graduated pharmacy school, like the medical legalization of cannabis products. Uh, so, of course, when I was in school and, and right out of uh, school, I was probably skeptical or non-believing that um, it played like a clinical role in treating disease states. And over the years, I've seen more and more data. I've, I've done uh, continuing education courses that are focused on cannabis, um, you know, THC treatments for uh, various disease states. And the, the evidence is good uh, that it that it can and does treat certain disease states very well with minimal side effects. So I've become uh, a bit of a supporter in, in, in that, uh, in that regard. Um, so psychedelics or, or other types of, you know, uh, medications or, or, um, planet grown drugs could certainly become, uh, accepted in mainstream. But again, if, if the evidence says that it's safe and effective, um, we always talk about evidence-based medicine. Uh, that's, that's the Western, Western approach for approving drugs is that you have to show some evidence and you've got to show a lot of evidence that something is safe and effective. And if it's, and if it's not, if it's borderline, A, it won't be approved, or if it is approved, it probably won't be very popular because a lot of doctors aren't going to stand behind it. You know, a doctor doesn't have to prescribe anything. They, they choose to do so based on their belief in something. So, you know, there have been going back to big pharma uh, discussion earlier, we were talking about um, maybe certain things that they do that I don't like. There, there's, there's been examples of drugs that come out that are basically totally worthless. Um, and there was no reason for them to develop it and push it. And capitalism kind of helps that just get thrown to the wayside. You know, if it doesn't work that well, or if it's outrageously expensive and isn't helping people, you can't sell it. So it kind Can of- Give me an example of something that came out and absolutely was not effective and was just pushed as a, a useless placebo yeah. product. Yeah. So there was um, not so much a placebo, but there was, well, we could, we could talk about two things. There was one medication and I, I, I can't, uh, I can't probably legally say what it was, but there was a pain medication years ago that was used for a long time, long enough for it to no longer be only available as a brand, but also as a generic, which typically takes like 10 years. So this drug, this, this, this um, pain medication was out for a very long time and used by a lot of different folks. It was pulled. The FDA pulled it because they said, we've got so much data to, to show that this doesn't work. It doesn't help you aside from one of the two ingredients that are in it, that you might as well just dispense that, that other ingredient. And that other ingredient uh, is an over-the-counter pain medication. So they pulled it. They said, it's not worth it. It's unsafe to even have people on this because you're exposing them to side effects unnecessarily. So that was one. Uh, that happened That happened probably 2009, 2010. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, a, a friend of mine in Philly who was Philadelphia, who was a, uh, a drug rep after he graduated. And he was in charge of selling what had to have been the worst drug I've ever heard. It was, um, it was a, a medication that was already available as a generic. It's been out for a while, but it was a strength that was in between the five and the 10 milligram. He was put in charge of selling that cheap generic. That sounds low to me. Strength. Is that, is that true? That, uh -huh. that, the, that dosage feels super low to me. Is that true or not? No, it, no it, it's, it's, it was seven and a half milligrams. Um, and, and this drug is used extremely commonly in five and 10. And you can get this drug for 20 or $30. And he was put in charge of selling this product that was seven and a half milligrams. So like right there in the middle, available as brand only. And it was like $300, $400. And uh, <laughs> I don't think he works there anymore, but I, I said he got, you know, he got dealt a bad deal there because um, that would be really a really tough sell.
Why are there such massive price swings between the name brand and the generic? Yeah, I mean, I think I think I could summarize that, that pretty pretty quickly. Um, so, in order in order to develop a medication, let's say I want to develop a medication that helps um, hair growth in the ear. You know, obviously something made up that you wouldn't want. But let's say let's say I want to develop that. Um, I have to first do animal trials. Well, I have to develop the drug first. I've discovered the drug first. Find out how we synthesize it what it does. So we test it on animals and then, then you start testing it on humans and, and uh, this whole long line of research. This, most drugs take, I think, three to five years to develop before they even get to like phase four on clinical trial. Um, so that costs hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe more. Um, so once I finally do get that approved um, and out, I need to make my money back. So these drug companies have to charge large amounts of money based on how many of these drugs or how many of the medication is going to be actually sold. So the, you know, if it's going to be something that like 60% of the population might want to take, now I can charge a little bit less. If it's something that 1% of the population is going to take, I've got to charge an extremely large amount of money. Those are actually called like orphan drugs. And there's some laws put in place to help drug companies develop these orphan drugs or else, you know, this 1% population disease state, may never have treatment because no drug company wants to put hundreds of million dollars in developing a drug to treat it if they can only then make a couple million dollars a year. Even though they'll help people, they, there, there's no way that they can make, you know, maintain that type of business structure. So there's extra funding for those folks. Um, I think tax, tax breaks. But yeah, so, that, so brand name products are expensive because they cost a lot to research. When you have a generic, uh, after 10 years, after the patent expires on a drug, you have any kind of generic company can say, all right, we know what the medication is. We know how it's dosed. All we have to figure out is how to mass produce it. We've got to do some studies to show that we are producing the exact same thing that that brand company produced and that it's equally as safe. And once they do that, they get to sell it as a generic. That part of the process is the cheap part of the process. It wasn't the discovery and the development. It's just literally the mass production in the safety monitoring and everything in the packaging and the selling. So that's why a generic gets to be so much cheaper than a brand name product. What, what's the most expensive product on the market right now? Is there a thousand dollar pill? Oh boy. Uh, I mean, there's, there's treatments for um, hepatitis C that are, I think around 30 or $40,000 a month. Oh my you God. Know, there's probably, I don't deal with chemo or anything like that on, in, in, in a retail pharmacy type setting, but I'm sure some of them are absolutely outrageous. Yeah, there's, there, there's, a, there's probably some orphan drugs that are maybe $50,000 per treatment, maybe more. I don't know. Uh, we, we typically see, I don't see too much that's more than maybe $10,000 a month. Wow. Do you ever... It's still a lot of money. Yeah, it's, it's a huge amount of money, especially <laughs> for like a normal working person, you know, to be able to afford... Mm -hmm. Do you ever witness like an end of life calculation that someone is forced to make when they realize that they just can't make ends meet to pay for the treatment? Have, have you ever seen that? Um, you know, I hear people talk about it a lot. Diabetics are put into positions where they may not be able to afford their insulin uh, in a certain month because especially Medicare patients, they get into a situation that's called the coverage gap or, or the donut hole, which is when their insurance that was allowing them to get their insulin at an affordable amount is now making them responsible for a majority of the chunk of the cost. And they do that until they get to the end of the year or until they dig themselves out of this coverage gap. So those folks are you know, faced with $600 for their, their, their monthly insulin or their three-month supply of insulin. And I think they have to do that internal, um, you know, uh, discussion as to, are they going to get it or are they going to do something else? Um, are they going to try to take less of it? Uh, they don't normally discuss that as much with like with the pharmacist. Um, but I hear them, you know, I hear them when we, when we have our counseling, you know, I've had a lot of people say that booze is cheaper and, you know, little jokes like that. A lot of people like to make, but yeah, I, I, there, there are certain drug classes that have gotten outrageous insulin being one of them um, inhalers is are awful. I mean, the, the price point on these inhalers is several hundred dollars per inhaler. And, um, I don't think it's fair. Um, I've been lucky enough not to need those types of things, but personally I would be, I would be extremely angry at that situation if I was.
you know, you're, you're not necessarily the person who is sitting down with a patient and diagnosing them of an illness and being there in that moment, dealing with them and their family. However, you are a part of another really intimate, vulnerable part of their life. And I know that I've heard with doctors, you know, after a certain point, doctors have to kind of shut off the empathy and go into business mode, right? And and they have to do it in order to do their job or else it just becomes too heavy. You know, I think Mm -hmm. social workers have to do that. I think EMTs, law enforcement have to do that. Do you feel like you find yourself having to slip into that mode with people? Does it still hit you? You know, how do you manage that? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's like an internal struggle. Like I was just discussing how expensive it is for, you know, for insulins and um, non-insulins and as well as like inhalers. Um, I think you have, you know, each pharmacist or anybody in the healthcare industry has to understand that they can only really control what they can control and to focus on the things that I can make a change on. Um, You know, I can't help you uh, with the cost of insulins, but I could I could help you to make sure you know how to use it properly and that you understand how to use it and why you're using it and in other ways of maybe altering your dietary habits or, you know, whatever the disease state may be. Uh, But just to try to help them in the ways that I can Um, in a perfect world, medications free and there are no diseases, you know, but that's not the world we live in. So I, I, there is, there is a struggle where, um, you know, you can talk to someone for a very long time, but then at the end of the day, there's not a whole lot more I could help you with, with this cost. Uh, You know, I'm not your insurance company and I didn't produce this drug. So I'm, I'm not the one trying to charge you $500. Ultimately the price tag on here is the price tag that your insurance company has worked out with, uh, with my company. And um, I'm just kind of the middleman. Pharmacists are definitely the middleman in almost any situation um, that we're in all four, all four of those parties that we're in, we're in the middle of, of someone. So yeah, you just, you control what you can. And you help in, in any way you can. You, I, I heard the word change a moment ago, and I feel like maybe that's a good way to segue in, into, the, into the end of this conversation. When you look at your industry, do you see anything that you feel like could improve, could use some improvement, could evolve to be better than it is right now in your business? And do you have any thoughts about the way that that might happen? I, I think that um, retail pharmacy is always going to be there in a, in a major capacity. I, I know that you know, Amazon or other major companies are moving towards mail order, um, which requires pharmacists as well. But as far as retail pharmacy goes, it's tough to be a place where you can go with the script, talk face to face with a healthcare professional, get your medication filled, ask questions at the end and go home and get what you need. And, and very frequently, I'm answering questions on the phone for people that probably aren't even my patients. They, you could just call any random pharmacy and, and it's not like I need your social or your insurance card in order to give you healthcare advice. So I think that's a, that's a very important role, probably underestimated, definitely underappreciated in my opinion. Um, and I don't think that's going anywhere, but I think that retail pharmacy in general has to make sure that it stays profitable in a way where we're not cheapening the industry. We're not just being a pill mill and, and, and licking and sticking, as I said before, a, a way for us to, to uh, be able to capitalize on the, the quality and the, um, you know, the knowledge that we have in helping people. So that, that tends to be that MTM uh, medication therapy management, that, that type of billing where we're getting towards um, of billing insurance companies for services we provide, not necessarily just medication, because a lot of times I can help you without even talking to you about medication. I can, I can tell you that you need to get an air purifier and that'll help you with your allergic rhinitis. And, you know, to be able to effectively make money on that and help patients at the same time is the direction I think retail pharmacy needs to go. Retail pharmacies themselves needs to also understand that you can't put that responsibility of the billing of the actual collection of the, of the money from the insurance company on the retail pharmacist at the corner over there because he or she is drowning in scripts and in counseling. So retail pharmacy needs to put a little bit more, um, realism in those areas of we've got to fund this in order to make this work, you know? 
I think I want to end with a story. And I'm sure that you remember it because I, I love it. It's one of my favorite ones. A- Adam and I went to the same high school. We've known each other since we were 11. There was a point in high school, I think it was junior year, when all of us got sent down to our guidance counselors uh, to figure out what we wanted to do with our lives. And I went down there and I don't know that I had any direction at all. I like to make stupid movies and uh, write scripts and things like that. And I didn't know what I was going to do with that. Um, and you went down and I remember you had a, whatever it was, a 30 minute, an hour long conversation with your guidance counselor who said, you're good at science. There's a need for pharmacists. You should do that. And you came back and you (laughs) said, I'm going to be a pharmacist. And you instantly (laughs) identified a good college that was the most expedient way to do that. You got the you know, whatever you call it, the, the internship or the apprenticeship at the, you know, local retail pharmacy. And you've been doing it for, you know, what, how long has it been? Two decades. Yeah. Yeah. A long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I, uh, uh, to go along with that story, I think I found the career of pharmacist in a book, a career book, uh, because we had to write a paper, uh, on what our career was going to be. And it was senior year. It was like September of senior year. And I had no clue. And I turned around and I asked Denise behind me, I said, Denise, what, what are you doing for this paper? She's like, you mean, what am I doing for my life? I said, well, yeah, that too. But like, what, what, what are you writing your paper on? She was like, page 73. And I flipped to page 73 and, and there was pharmacy and it just sounded good. And then uh, I took it from there. I just put my, put my head down and that's what I did. And luck, luckily it's worked out pretty well. <laughs> Well, I really appreciate your time giving us a peek into America's Medicine Cabinets. Uh, I love you, buddy. Thanks for being my first uh, episode. My pleasure, dude. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again to Dr. Adam Fuline for being generous with his time. Josh Has Issues is produced and hosted by yours truly, Josh Murphy. If you like the show and want to help spread the message, you know the drill. Like, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and most importantly, tell a buddy. Josh Has Issues is a production of Mad West Content, Inc.